Hey everyone, and welcome to this talk about being a sound nomad. My name is uh, Martin Kvala and I will be your host for this brief uh, hour of your life. And I hope you'll have a good time, I'm sure as hell will. Um, I'm from Norway, uh, I'll go into that a bit more later. And uh, I wanted to start off first with a little talk uh, and a little story of what happened uh, early this year. Because I was traveling with my mom and um, we were going to France to see my brother, who was studying there, and at some point she called me up and she says, hello son, I say hello mother. She says, are you aware that we're going to travel in two weeks to France? I said, yes. I mean, I wasn't aware. I, was, I knew we were going at some point, but I, I'm bad with dates. Uh, and she says, like, well, it's two weeks. Should we figure out luggage? And I've never done that before, figured out luggage two weeks before, so I... Uh, I was a bit surprised. Um, so I usually travel a lot, and I usually go to conferences, and I, um, I guess my habits are kind of refined by just knowing what I need for whatever I need to go. And uh, I kind of uh, started through that trip to look at how my mother and my brother traveled through France on a car and on airplanes and uh, in hotels, and how I would do things. And it was very interesting because I actually realized that at some point then that traveling, just like a lot of other all of the skills, you know, in life or professionally, is a skill, and uh, it's uh, it's kind of highly beneficial, I think, in our industry to be good at traveling, and it's potentially liberating if you also do it right. I also will take a little bit of notes, so you can take notes of this, or maybe not. There you go. So, I basically started doing games about six years ago, maybe seven, I think closer to seven. And uh, mean, while I was doing that, uh, I got into working with uh, a game called Among the Sleep. I traveled to uh, basically Gamescom, I traveled to Amaze, I went to Norwegian game conferences and um, Nordic game conferences. and. Um, Based on the travels, I had uh, done well showing the game, and the people I had met while doing so, I, uh, I decided to travel for six months. Um, basically, I had the stability, and I had a studio that I also was working on still while doing so, and um, I wanted to try how that worked. Um, I basically had a loose plan. I traveled for six months, and I didn't have a concrete deadline coming up. I had no games I was releasing. But I had a loose plan and trusted uh, about asking friends or people I had met during previous travels about uh, advice and to decide kind of where I would go next. Um, after six months, I came home and I got asked to do a talk in Karlshaven about basically traveling and working as a sound nomad. And uh, I did it. And two years later, my good friend Laura asked me to, if to do a talk about traveling as a nomad again. So I did, but this is more like an updated thing, and I also wanted to mix a little bit more about what the theme of uh, the Sweden Game Conference is about, which is basically technology, how it affects us, how the cultures work around, and how games is affected and affects uh, around what things around us. Um, so I'm going to focus mostly on travel and how technology and travel and making games go hand in hand and which tools, what guidance, experience, and knowledge do the thing gives me, and how do I make it work, and how it shapes me. I still work full-time at a studio I co-own, and uh, pays my wages. I also do freelance games on the side, uh, and I travel pretty much almost as much as I did when I traveled for six months. I, I barely see my home. My family dog does not recognize me. Uh, I'm also a sound designer, so I do sound mostly for games, which is funny that I'm actually in the biggest hall today. I think once they realize I'm a sound designer and not like a fancy speaker that does you know, graphics, they will probably throw me out here. So we probably got more like three minutes before I get thrown off stage. So traveling. It's basically never been easier. Right now, we have the cheapest tickets pretty much for traveling we ever had. Uh, the quickest planes 
We have uh, tools and great things that help us plan and execute travel to great extents. The game community we work on is fairly open and connected to traveling in our field is possible. We can ask friends and strangers for suggestions and help. Traveling is a skill, and traveling while working is a double skill we need to learn if you, if you plan to do what I do. Because there are distractions, there are delays, there are unfamiliar infrastructures, there's dodgy networks, there's paranoid hippies, there's food your stomach is not used to, there's time zone differences, and there's Trello, Asana, Slack, Skype, airport check-in, power socket variation. And it's not necessarily an easy thing, even though travel is easier than ever, it can be grating. It can be draining, it can take up a lot of mental space and leave you low on energy. And everywhere you travel, it's constantly demanding attention. And you might get lost, but it can also be liberating. And also getting lost can also be liberating, I feel. So my thoughts and opinion on traveling while working is, I think as a freelancer, uh, it's essentially working on the same side as someone else. It's a thousand percent more fun to work with someone else than sitting on Skype calls and uh, setting up source tree and whatever is kind of having to work with anyone these days when you work externally. Um, I would say it's uh, worth traveling to work with someone, even though you need to commute, you need to pack up and travel and flight and check in and luggage retrieval and trains will be delayed and you will be stressed. Uh, but I figured out they also learned to live from that stress. I feel like the pros outweighs those cons. And um, you'll also get more exposed to on vulnerable, you know, to catching a cold. Let's say you go to a conference on the way home, it's very usual to get sick. I get sick a lot, or at least I used to before I learned how to travel with a scarf. It's very good to keep your neck warm, and it's also good to kind of hide a little bit so you don't breathe in a lot of airport germs. And uh, it's also very worth realizing that um, by deciding to do something like suddenly traveling for a while, you can actually say, like, uh, sublet your apartment and uh, you will kind of live rent free and you can put that money into tickets, traveling, basically. So, travel is a skill. Oh, this is very slow. But it is also a privilege. Uh, let's see if we can switch things. Yes, it's a skill, but it's also a privilege. I believe that I come from a place, this is Norway. Uh, I believe I come from a place that gives me a Scandinavian passport port, and uh, I'm white. So I have a fair amount of uh, freedom to travel as I please. And I have my own company that I own, and I also work in a company full time that I partly own. Uh, and I can invoice and operate from anywhere. And I was also lucky enough to have a project when I started traveling that people could recognize. Uh, so I, uh, I could basically quicker get introductions to people and they would remember me easier. Uh, and um, I basically got a free start because of that and got to plan and uh, build up enough of a network that when I decided to go traveling more, I did have the people, enough people all around the world so I can actually do this. I think right now we're listening to a little part of what I recorded in uh, Tokyo. A little street on the side of a ramen place where I was recording some cars going past. That's the car. I also um, was lucky to start traveling professionally and maybe able to do it for free because we live in a socialized country and uh, I can essentially uh, um, get funding from the government to travel to GDC, which not everyone is lucky to be. So, yeah, again, I feel I'm a, I feel I have a lot of privileges. I'm also a man. I'm also identified as a man, uh, so I can easily move around safely uh, alone. I don't have to walk around in groups, uh, and I'm seldom threatened except this one guy who once punched me because I took the last spring roll at 7-Eleven at 2 a.m. one place. So. As a sound designer and as a traveler, how does travel affect my work? <laughs> I might just look for nice pictures instead, because this is very slow. But uh, basically, travel affects my work in many ways. 
because I need to figure out how to work while I travel. So I pack light. This is, uh, again, in Japan, because uh, Japan is also a very nice place to record and take things from. But um, this is kind of what I travel with. I have a recorder. I pack light. I have a synthesizer from Sweden. I have a MacBook Pro, uh, which is very stable. I usually carry around some uh, liquids, because it's good to be hydrated. Uh, I carry around a tablet and a little game playing device, because I like to keep playtime and work time separated. And passport, because I like kind of getting to countries and out. Some countries are very not happy about you not having your passport, and it's a problem. I do not have a double screen, um, and I carry also like a few USB ports. And most important, that is not there because I used it as a photograph machine, is my phone. My phone can also like tether internet to my other devices, and most of the places I go to in the world, I can literally sit and work from the top of a mountain. I also wear noise cancelling earbuds because they're great when you travel. You can actually sleep and you can uh, basically in an airplane, you can sleep on them. If you ever try to sleep on noise cancelling headphones, it's not that nice. So how I travel also limits how I work. I need to use headphones. I need to use earbuds. I can't bring um, big uh, speakers around. So that basically means that I can't fine-tune things. I need to find places to, at least the ones during a project, usually at the end, I need to find a place where I can master and listen to things in a controlled environment that I know. Which means that I have an auxiliary unit back home. I have a speaker set up that I will not have to return to. Maybe once every second month, unless I know of a good setup or a good friend somewhere. Um, and I end up using a lot of Slack. Trello, all the things that everyone uses, but it's way more dependent uh, when you travel because it's the way to kind of keep up with uh, other tra other companies that you work with, right? And uh, I can only do travel because I'm connected to my phone, connected to the internet, connected to cafes, connected to co-working spaces. Uh, I think it's pretty beautiful that through technology I can record something, I snip it in my phone, which has a pretty good microphone, and by the time I put it down on the table, my laptop has the exact same sound, and I can play that and start tweaking with it. Uh, the bad things about traveling and working. Let's see now. This is a picture of my phone. The bad things about working while traveling is that it's hard to work while you travel. It's different time zones, especially if you travel across the world. You will have meetings 2 o'clock in the night. Uh, day and uh, 2 o'clock at night, you, might, you don't know if you have internet. Like, I was in Australia, and I had a meeting. But I could never have the meetings where I was staying, because the hippie I was staying at, he was afraid that internet would get in his head uh, as he was, um, as he was uh, sleeping. So he would turn off the internet at 8 p.m. each day. So I would have to go to a noisy pub and sit around having business meeting when a lot of drunken people were sitting around me shouting and stuff like that. It's not ideal. And you're working away from a team, which is also, if you, if you all, I don't know if you all are sitting with a lot of teams or like sitting together as you work, but I recommend it because it's very nice. You get to have all these nice small conversations that you lose out on when you just have scheduled Skype meetings. You don't have those small comments that sort of like lead to you having a good idea. Uh, and you lose out on that a lot, which is not that nice. Actually, I was a little bit smart, I think, and did this already. Oop. Ah, yeah. Um, and I will do like this. Ah. I'm sorry, but my computer is a little slow today, it seems. There will be stress trying to meet an obligation. As you travel, you never know quite where you're going to end up. You, don't, you maybe haven't been in a city before yet, and knowing exactly where to find internet can sometimes vary wildly, which means that sometimes you try to plan to meet and reach a destination in time for a meeting, but it's not always easy, and sometimes you at least you're scrambling or running around the city of shouting, like, if anyone has free Wi-Fi, like, run into a cafe, just sweaty, and it's like, hey! <laughs> you know, um, basically, you, you become a little bit of stressed out, basically, I find. Let's see. And it's kind of hard to have habits, because, and this is personally something I enjoy, but I think a lot of people like habits. Um, I think it's very good because, uh, you can't really always brush your teeth at 8 o'clock. You can't always get up at 8 o'clock. 
Um, you can't go the same way to work and have the same coffee. You can't have your latte because in some countries they don't have milk. Um, you can't have your stable work environment where you have the same five posters up there that will inspire you with work of art and stuff like that, or, or like a common board you reference every morning. But there's real-time board for that, right? Um, also, depending on your work, uh, imagine being in the Philippines and there is sun outside, but you have a deadline and you're sweating your ass off while you're trying to kind of fix some delicate pixel work. It can also be hard. And uh, yeah, the working environment, it's very hard to predict. You can maybe go to some incubators or you can go to some co-working spaces or libraries, which I love, but it's basically hard to keep a routine. But for instance, I think that is very nice. I thrive in that one. And I think for so a lot of people wouldn't like it. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, and you will learn how to travel. You will learn how to like maximize how what you do and what you need to have like an exact kind of good little thing. Um, this is a little cool thing they did in Japan, with uh, having a bird sound at night in the subway would mean that people would be less violent. And I found that was kind of cool, so I recorded it while I was in Japan. You will also learn how to prioritize, and you will know exactly what to bring in your backpack. Uh, you get to see things, like when I was traveling for six months, I went to Double Fine, I went to Utrecht, I went to Cambria, which is in North England, I went to Melbourne and went down the entire Australian coast. I, went to, I ended up in uh, GDC uh, and sat with Double Fine for a week because I had met one of their uh, animators earlier on uh, that trip. And uh, you get to shake up your habit and learn a little bit more about how you work. And I feel you get to be more creative. Personally, there's nothing more I like better than to sit somewhere new and try to look at the same old problem and see, be able to have a new atmosphere around you as you figure it out. And you get to learn how to fail and do things right. I believe in the failing is good. You get to actually get pretty far by doing that. And let's see, no. And yeah, I think that's a good list, basically. And let's see now. Sir, things are a little bit slow today, and I apologize for that. It's kind of funny how things sometimes don't work perfectly when there's a lot of computers for. Um, so. For you who are planning it, uh, or want to actually try to freelance and travel, or travel more, or travel something at all, uh, and is kind of daunted by the prospect of trying to do something like that, uh, the good thing is like you have a lot of the skills you need, and most of here are Swedish, I guess, maybe some Danish. Are there any more nationalities? Like you can shout out your nationality if you can. Norwegian. Wow. Cool. <laughs> Turkey. Germany, yes. Uh, so that's very good, actually. Um, this cool thing about this is you all know people, uh, maybe not the German and Norwegian, uh, but you will after a beer or two. Um, and there's like then at least five like, five countries represented here in uh, in a Sweden Game Conference, and uh, and uh, and these people know people, and those people know people, people. And the longer you are here, the more times you go and see the same people. Um, you will basically, I guess that's what they call networking. You get to know more, more people along the way. And that's kind of nice. Um, you kind of get to surf the social interactions and uh, friendship. And by being easygoing and generous with those who share your home, you'll find that it's very easy to go from one place to the other without a plan. You will get plenty of recommendations. And I think by Twitter or Reddit or game slacks or Discord, it shouldn't be it should be easier than ever now. Um, I also find that there's a lot of practical tips. And did I manage to write that down? Oh. Whoa. Also, my, head, my nephew loved that I traveled. But basically, there's a lot of tips uh, that is about travel that I could also, also kind of write down very quickly. But uh, Google Maps. Google uh, Translate. Maps is very good because you can have offline maps in case you're in the middle of a Japanese forest and you don't know the way out and you don't get reception, which I did a few times. Um, I always download my maps ever since. Google Translate is very good because there's not everyone who has uh, languages you understand. And you can literally just with Google Translate take a picture or a film of what you're looking at and it will translate it for you, which is amazing. 
Wow, okay, I'm not gonna. Um, let's see, well, I'm gonna see if I find a nice one. Oops. <laughs> Uh, here, I guess. Yeah. This is nice. Um, always bring a phone. Always bring a battery pack. Bring maybe three battery packs. Some of them charge as laptops now, which is good. I would recommend that. Uh, Twitter, it was very much nicer a few years ago, but it's still kind of nice. Reddit are nice. When I travel, actually, local server rates are great for meeting other foreigners that are lonely. I, uh, some of my best friends now I met at the New Year in Hong Kong, where I just was bored and I needed someone to party with, and it was very nice. Um, and I would recommend seeking out anything which is a library, airport, uh, or uh, even a train. Trains are amazing to work from. Uh, also, like indie game, indie train jam? Train jam, I guess, is also worth. I would also recommend because it's very nice and people can help you doing some stuff. Um, and I would recommend if you travel, have an open agenda. Uh, don't lock too much in place and be ready to kind of see whatever happens. And have some extra cash because if, if, in case you get robbed or you need to use something and they don't take a credit card, having 20 euros is good to be just like here and you kind of fix that thing. And uh, if, if you want to go somewhere, look for local game developers. If there's no events happening, you make one yourself and invite everyone. Some of people uh, show up sometime and it's usually a very nice thing. So it is becoming more and more easy to travel, but at the same time, wait, let's see. Yeah, it's becoming more and more easy to travel, and it's at the same time, I also know, uh, it's worth know, mentioning that the last two years, I know there is more tension internationally, and um, uh, things might change and get for the worst, uh, and things might get harder to travel with, and uh, I don't know, I know Brexit is upcoming, or maybe there's no deal, maybe there's a deal. And Trump, every time he writes something, I feel like the world is like a little bit, little bit less safe or uncertain seems to anger a lot of people. That can have diplomatic ramifications and suddenly we're not allowed to go to the US anymore, who knows. Um, also in technology, internet is getting fragmented and risks closing off large numbers of uh, users into walled gardens. It's nations getting their own versions, own search engines. Uh, and recently several countries cancelled technology just as like an example of heightened, um, I guess, heightened political climate uh, tensions. They cancelled uh, several technologi technological chips from China uh, after a rumor that products had uh, essentially, essentially spyware, I guess, in it. So I, I'm working with a numerous amount of teams. I work with, uh, amongst others, people from England, and we don't quite know if what's going to happen and how we're going to work, how we're going to set up contracts and stuff with a no-deal Brexit, for instance. So it's, it's affecting the more you work uh, abroad and with teams abroad, away from your own culture. So let's see now. So this is a Scandinavian song. It's actually made in Sweden, which shocked me a little bit. And um, I do feel I bring my culture along when I travel. Uh, I do feel that whatever I do kind of ends up being a f f fingerprint of the culture I'm from. Like, for instance, we used this song in the first game I worked in, uh, which is called Among the Sleep, uh, which is here. It's uh, that one. It's basically like a baby horror game, and we wanted to capture what made our childhood kind of feel like kids, and definitely Trollmorsvigvisa, so as you may call it in Swedish, was definitely something that all of us felt a strong affinity to. Um, and I spread awareness about the game scene in Norway and other parts of the world, of, and of individuals and scenes I've seen or heard, or heard about, and I learn about new places, and I meet new people. and. Uh, they invite me to other places or recommend me other places. I kind of feel like it's this node-based cool interaction game where you get more and more uh, nodes and it gets messy at some point, but also pretty lovely and you can go anywhere, which is fun. Uh, also going to other cultures and seeing and working with other teams brings out awareness in your own. 
Uh, for instance, just the Norwegians weird fascination with brunost, which is like this brown goat cheese that a lot of foreigners find atrocious. Um, but I know maybe how about, also I think it's worth mentioning like I'm very naive coming from a Scandinavian country and we all are if you are. Uh, I've numerous times been told off by people on the street because I carry my phone just like hanging out of my pocket or like or if I like my wallet has been stolen like four times and I kind of have this feeling that you know oh but why would anyone steal my wallet why couldn't they just have their own wallet you know um, that's definitely a cultural thing I have from Scandin being you know brought up in Scandinavia um, and also like just I was living in Australia that's where I learned how to actually talk to more than one person at a time and it was definitely interesting to see how uh, um, a culture that's kind of by default a bit extroverted is versus where I come from, which I see as Norway as fairly introverted in kind of comparison. Um, I also feel like meeting cool new cultures bring insight and experience, and they kind of bring a humbleness for there's a lot of things you don't know out there, and uh, there's a lot of cool things uh, that you have yet to learn. One of my favorite moments uh, about culture was uh, staying with my friend uh, Ken and his family in Japan. Uh, Ken is a sound designer at Square Enix, and uh, that means that since he works in a Japanese company, I was basically staying there. Uh, we got to hang out maybe five hours one night. The rest of the time, he was mainly uh, off working 16 hour days. His mother was Indian and was teaching Japanese elderly women how to talk English. And uh, she would call me into the study rooms a few times a day, and uh, basically, we would have coffee, and all these Japanese older women around 50, 60, who would kind of be so fascinated with being able to speak English because they were learning this. And especially to have a Vikingu, as they would say, uh, amongst their mates, which is a Viking in Japanese. Um, and they would tell, and I would tell them about that Norway was, wasn't Viking anymore. We didn't have horns on our helms or helms at all. But we had Brunost, which they were very interested in. And I sent them a pack, and they thought it was OK. Um, and I would learn for, uh, stuff about Japan. Uh, it was definitely like, I referenced Japan a lot because it was definitely one of the countries that felt most of a culture shock. Yet again, when I traveled to Japan, I went from Australia. So it was a welcome one because in Australia, everyone is sort of like, you have no personal space in Australia because everyone intrudes it all the time. But in Japan, everyone just neatly gives you your meter of personal space, no matter how thick of a crowd it is, which is lovely, quite Scandinavian actually. Maybe that's why Scandinavians like Japan, because we can go there and feel alone in a city. <laughs> so um, another thing is later that week, and I'm going to try this. Let's see now. Later that week, I... Oh, shit, I need to... Sorry, there's a cliff now. So please, please, please. Ah, where's YouTube? Where's YouTube? Oh, no, 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 no. Also, Tinder is very good. I forgot to say that, but Tinder is amazing. Because uh, when you travel, just kind of saying to people like, I'm looking for, uh, I'm just looking, I'm here for a day, I'm just looking for someone to show me around. And it's amazing. So I got to tell Japanese streamers about Brunost being like a thing we did instead of like a heart thing. We did Brunost, and um, it was it was very fun, and we got to. So pitch our game to a Japanese audience as well, so I guess it was a win-win situation. Um, I also think that working with cultures, uh, across cultures, is uh, it brings context and knowledge uh, that is valued for when developing a game. And kind of when we look at what we're doing, uh, video games like these, uh, and like this. This is Swedish, by the way, and this is Swedish. Um, I think it's kind of very good to have like a broad uh, group of uh, backgrounds because you are developing for an international market. Uh, I think in Norway we have a very small uh, game community and no one feels specifically pressured that they're competing with any anyone else because there is, I mean, we sell maybe a thousand copies in Norway, maybe two thousand. It's like, it's, it's 
if there's like a kind of fight between companies, like it doesn't even pay off to bring like a gun to a fight. It's, the bullet costs more than what you get from Norwegian customers. Um, but I mean, it is it is kind of important because um, cultural sort of differences is quite important. We had a game called uh, Progress coming out from uh, Denmark, and how am I doing on time? I think I'm doing pretty well. Uh, we had a we had a uh, game called Progress coming out, which is basically uh, it's an iPad game where I uh, use my iPad to go around, and it says like uh, learn to tap, and I I, I kind of learn how to walk across the screen, screen or birds as there when you have to do like this, and that sort of solves the riddle, and you get to the next level. Uh, another one is like horse, and you need to like, and you, if you do this movement, you will get the level. Um, and we learned like when we were testing it that for some reason every American would fail at a certain level, and the level was uh, only vowels, and only vowels was basically uh, it said only vowels across the screen, and you would have to kind of figure out that I need to press on and hold on the vowels. So we have it written, we had it written down, and I would see some Americans try this. And they were just like, I see. They saw the O, and they saw the E, but they would never press Y. And fittingly enough, to the letter, I was like, Why? Why don't you press that? It's a vowel. After like watching t three people being frustrated, and they were like, Nah, why is not a vowel? Why is like a consonant? <laughs> and I think for everyone else in American, that's like, that, that's completely wrong. But for in America, for some reason, Y is not so. We had a lot of issues playtesting this game for an entire uh, region before we figured out that this stupid little thing uh, was very different. Another thing uh, worth kind of saying is uh, and mentioning as an example is uh, there was a Honda, I guess, who released a car once called the Honda like Fitta or something like that, and it was like a huge failure uh, because I guess they should have kind of tried to see if. Some countries had us as a bad name. Maybe if they had a Scandinavian on the team, they would be like, I don't think this is a very good, good thing. And also like the troll mode I played earlier, uh, kind of also realizing and uh, knowing what that does when you put something like that in the game that some players have a very strong connection with, but other people have no connection at all. How does that work? How does it work? And how does it affect people? Having people from various uh, backgrounds help you kind of navigate this easier. Um, and I think we're kind of closer to uh, wrapping up this with some Q&A. So I just want to tell first, like, there are some challenges, I feel, that comes from working across cultures. And one of them is basically language barriers. Uh, I was working with some South Africans on a game called Genital Jousting. I think it's this one. Uh, oh, no, I guess. Oh, yeah, this one. It's, it's about penises. It's a sexual, healthy game um, about penetrating each other and be friends. And um, I had the biggest problem with one of the developers because he was arriving on the first. And um, I, I, I was a little bit too shy to ask him what which day the first was. And I also asked other people, also South Africans for that reason, if they knew which day which date is the first, November the first. What is first? And uh, for, because I can kind of see that as four numbers, but. Uh, that was a little bit confusing, and uh, that's something we do when you work on people that has like different secondary languages or not even speaking English or Norwegian or Swedish that well. And of course, communication barriers. A very quick uh, thi thing I learned very early while working was that everyone who comes to Norway to work has a very big different difficulty for the first six months because the way to lead a company in Norway is very, very flat. Because Norway was, you know, owned by Denmark and Sweden, we never had. This is my theories, I guess, but we never had like a socialist, like elitist class in our country. So because of that, we don't really know how to have a hierarchy. So everyone is just like, "Hello, Shell. Hello, Petter." And Petter is like the king of Norway, you know. Like we, we, don't, we just don't know how to do that. So a, a boss would come over in Norway and tell like someone who works there, like maybe someone from the UK, um, like he would show you, he would show him something and say like, "Hey, um, this thing over there. Uh, could you take a look at this?" And the and it's very usual for people to misunderstand that and think like, okay, I looked at it, it looks fine, and let's put it down again. Whereas, of course, in Norway, if you told that to some Norwegian, they would uh, get like, oh, it's um, this actually more means do this thing, please. And that kind of leading style can be very frustrating, I think, for people who's used to like being told more. And in Norway, we're very confrontational, shy, and we have, as we say, like 
uh, pillows padded on our elbows, which is sort of how we do things very, very slowly and very... If you've seen the Viking show, that's exactly how it is in Norway. Uh, the, the comedy Viking show, not a really bad one. Let's see now, I want to find the right picture for this. So I do think that travel brings instability, but I also think instability means essentially a state of change. Oh, let's find a... Here, this is good. The people you meet and the things you attend is shifted hugely, and the most people you meet will help you with suggestions, tips, information, um, and connecting you with other people. I think it lets you, traveling that is, learn to recognize and be ready for a change. Uh, and it, learns, it makes you learn and recognize when you see a change that you want to embrace, and it, learns to, it uh, makes you learn how to recognize a change that you don't want to embrace, because every choice you do is a like a path one way or the other, right? And um, I do think that uh, technology allowing, allows our people who believe in an idea to work together, despite not being in the same location. And I think that allows more interesting and esoteric, innovative ideas to happen, and more kindred spirits to find each other. So I live in breeze traveling. Uh, I think it brings out the best in me and what I do. And I feel we live in a time where it's possible to live free of more constraints than ever before. I live this way I do because it allows me to work on projects uh, and people I fit the best with. Um, which is not always with, uh, in my backyard, you know. But I kind of think with, through the whole traveling and technology issue that I've been talking about, um, it kind of makes that the world is your backyard, so it all kind of works out in the end. Thank you. I, I also think uh, it's possible to have some questions if there are some. So uh, if there's anyone, please put your hand up and stand up and you will get a microphone. And you can talk into it and we can listen to it. Yes, you. I get this, yes. How do you get your work? How do you find people to work with? Um, I get it from traveling. I, I find that by going to like a maze or GDC, um, I usually go to network and I never go to, well, I, I go to meet people and I never really go there to sell services or, or try to like get anything. Um, and I think that that kind of follows up that I just kind of meet people and rather after some time gravitate towards the people I feel we could work well together and if they feel the same thing, uh, it's basically like a friend thing, right? So after a while, we're like, hey, we're friends. Should we do something fun together? And um, that together with the fact that I can introduce myself, something like now, and I can be up here and say, like, hey, I'm... Wait. I mean, I can't do it right now. But hey, I'm Martin Kvale. I do audio music games and stuff. And, and now you all know who I am, right? So uh, I don't have to do the pitch all again like 50 times tonight. So. I think going around and traveling and sharing and talking and, uh, and presenting things, uh, and of course, I get to present things that people know, have heard about before, so it's, it's definitely like a luxury, but um, I do feel like that's kind of how I get the majority of my things. How I got the first gigs was basically just, I was just kind of poking them and saying like, hey, I, I'm in Norway now, I want to work on games. And, uh, and at some point, someone gave me a job. Uh, and it's the same thing I d did for another few games like uh, Owlboy, because everything was so good except the sound, which was like not that good yet. So I kind of just told them, like, hey, I'm coming over in a week, and, uh, and you can pay me later, but I'm going to work on your game now. You can, you can say no if you don't want it, but if I don't hear from you, I'm just going to show up. Um, of course, don't do that like, without actually having a good feel of the people you're doing it to, because it's kind of intrusive. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that answers your question. I, I also got, got a gig once because I said we should work together to someone who said like, no, wait, yeah. No, I, th I think I just went up to someone and said we should work together. And he was like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So I mean, <laughs> I guess that's like an Australian thing, maybe. It's definitely not Scandinavian. Anyone else? We have uh, time for two more questions, I think. Maybe three. Yes, hey. Uh, this was a microphone coming your way. I can maybe stand like this. Oh, water. Uh, when you say you travel a lot, which sounds amazing, by the way, 
do you tend to gravitate more towards certain countries or is it like more all over the place in the world? I do like warmth. Like, <laughs> I, um, yeah, I, when I first traveled for six months, it wasn't like, it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't a, an accident that it was from uh, October to GDC because, you know, uh, I also learned in Australia that uh, it's nice with warmth and I came home midwinter in Norway and I was depressed and didn't see the sun for two weeks and that wasn't too nice. Uh, but I, I think I, right now I, I travel kind of where I want, I need to travel, like for instance I work with Ditto on Gunner here. Does it work? We don't know. Um, huh. And uh, he lives now up in Kiruna, Kiruna, right? And I'm a part of a project that's like uh, this abandoned airport in the middle of the north of Norway that I go up to like once in a while as well because we're, we bought it because we were 20 people that was really stupid and they sold it because they couldn't use it as an airport. So um, I do go north sometimes. Uh, I also want to go to Canada maybe sometime. And I wouldn't mind going to Svalbard if you know where that is, but it needs to be an event. And I think there's like only one game developer in Svalbard and he's not very social. Uh, next person, over there, I think, yeah. Hi. Uh, you might have told this already, but I was wondering, like, um, how, did, how did it come to be that you started traveling so much? I think that um, in Krillbyte, which made the baby horror game called Among the Sleep and is now working on Mosaic, we are... Um, all of us traveled a lot in the beginning, uh, but I definitely think I took a strong liking for it. Um, I think I like the things it, it, it brings more than other people. So I think that also makes me gravitate towards it. Um, so that's, I think that's why. Uh, personally, I just like that feeling of being very, very uh, on my toes. You know, like I go to the airport, I'm not sure what's what I'm gonna do when I land. Uh, I don't know, quite know, you know, where I'm gonna work from sometimes, or like, I buy a one-way ticket and I don't know if the next day place is gonna be back home. But uh, I definitely like that feeling of just kind of things being up in the air a bit. It makes me feel personally good, and I thrive, I think, with that sort of thing. Which is a problem, because like, the more you travel, the more used to get to, you get to traveling, and the more people you meet while traveling, and you get home and you're like, oh, but I want to go to that friend now who lives there, but then I have to travel again. So I, th I think it, kind of, it came from a preference, and it kind of snowballed into like, well, now most of my friends live everywhere, so how do I see them except for traveling? <laughs> I also invite a lot of people back to Norway, which is great because no one ever comes, so everyone starts feeling guilty about things, and they're nice and buys me beer. So yeah, you know. <laughs> and so I guess I mean some people come to Norway sometimes, but not that many. Uh, but I definitely think that yeah, I, I like it, so I I, su I search for it, and I have that possibility with the company I work with that I can work anywhere. Um, so yeah, I, I want I want I grab that and I like it basically. I think we have time for one last question. I don't want to intrude too much on the next person's time. Uh, anyone else? Last question. This is like this got to be a really good one. It can also be about sounds. I also do sound design, or like Swedish games. I can have opinions about the Swedish game uh, game industry. I have great many opinions about that. No, no, I, I don't have that much. But everyone is nice here. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And thank I was wondering, you. what is your like? top favorite countries you traveled to in, yeah, <laughs> when you were working? Uh, what, what, were the, what were the best, I don't know, inspiration or, I think you understand my question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the top, question, the top places I like to visit and work from, basically. Um, I definitely have my favorites. I love Melbourne in Australia. They have an amazing library there that like has, has eight sides. And that's like that's beautiful to me, and I, for some reason I can sit there and work forever. Um, I really like Copenhagen. I travel there a lot, um, and uh, the same thing with Utrecht and Netherlands, in uh, Holland. I mean, uh, and I really like Austin, Texas. A lot of it because of Fantastic Arcade, which is kind of like the same as MAs, but just like less partying. Um, and Berlin, I really, really like Berlin, and uh, I think. Those are like the immediate places I'm always like happy to go to. I, I, I go to San Francisco a lot, but 
it's an interesting city and there's a lot of things happening there because of GDC, but I also get so sad because you see people there being treated horribly each day and just, you know, living wherever they can and just, uh, yeah, so maybe not San Francisco, but I like it a lot otherwise. Um, I have a lot of places still I want to travel, but those are definitely like Australia, Utrecht, uh, uh, Copenhagen, and, uh, and uh, Austin is definitely some of my favorites. I guess most of them are in warmer places than Norway, so that kind of also ties in with the earlier question. Cool. I think that should be enough, and I'll be around and having beers and hanging out and going on the show floor. If you have some games or questions or anything, I'm, I'm, I'm very friendly and I uh, like to talk to people, and I, uh, I will be here until Saturday. So thanks so much again, and thanks for the questions.